Good morning, data science students. I hope you're all doing well, staying happy, healthy, and safe. And yes, it is in fact morning. Uh, I usually record these things later in the day, but uh, yesterday I, I tried to record this lecture three times and some technological other disaster happened each time. And uh, here we are, bright and early, three hours earlier than I'd usually get up, but uh, chocked full of nice uh, dark roast coffee. I'm usually a medium roast guy, doing something different this morning. And we're going to be talking about neural networks. So this bizarre and very unexpected semester is about to wrap up. So this is the final topic we're going to cover in this class. And it's the topic of your final project. So stay tuned. <clears throat> so any of you who have been in this class for any length of time know that I love a good brain. Brains are weird and they're wonderful and they're complicated and and they're from an engineering point of view you can think of them as as really interesting computational devices now there's so much more than that and you know uh they're they're responsible for for not just letting us figure out how to say one plus one two plus two which by the way we, we do rather slowly and pretty inefficiently but it's also responsible for us experiencing the aroma of coffee uh enjoying a vast open green field tasting pad thai or or enjoying the 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 comfort of, of a warm blanket in winter this weird gray goo of stuff that's folded in on itself this has been growing inside of your head since since before you were born <clears throat> can do all these amazing things it can teach you how to ride a bike it can uh, you you learn you can learn how to sew or knit or whatever and it's all done from this guy it's crazy and this is really interesting properties that sometimes we would like our computers to have can our computers learn how to do a skill for us can we give our computers a data set and it figure out the patterns for us uh, right now you know they're not great at these kind of things and, and maybe someday they will and hopefully with help of data scientists like yourself they will but this bizarre learning machine how does it actually function well, we need to look, uh, well, the, the, the longer answer is that we're not entirely sure, uh, but we've got, we've got a good idea of the basics of it. Uh, so if we look at the, the, the smallest computational unit of the brain, we're going to see this guy. And you've probably seen figures similar to this in your, your biology and psychology classes. And if you're lucky, a sensation and perception class. This is the neuron. Uh, the neuron is the smallest unit of processing in your head and it, it's really really neat it's a, it's a data processing unit but it's also a living biological cell now just like any other cell it has certain properties that that you're probably familiar with it, it has a body it, it has a membrane it has a nucleus and here's where it differs it takes signals from other neurons as input and then provides output to other neurons this is really neat. <clears throat> so here we have our dendrites. Our dendrites are the, the, the terminals that take input from their surroundings, take input from other neurons. And then that signal, those signals rather, get processed in some way and then manipulated and a single signal is sent out through the axon to the terminals and then distributed to other neurons surrounding. So this is, this is actually very similar to how things like logic gates work. So for, for those of you who, uh, you know, may, may have some electrical engineering background or, uh, or some basic computer science background, you, you may be familiar with the concept of logic gates, a little tiny processing pieces of hardware that take in simple signals and output simple signals. So like, for instance, your computer is essentially uh, and the, uh, this is an oversimplification, of course, uh, but your computer can be represented as just a combination of NAND logic gates connected in, uh, in series and in parallel over and over and over, and complex results arise from the signals that you put in. Now, it's not too surprising that we can get such complex behavior from a human brain uh, if we think about the complex behavior we can get out of a computer that's essentially just made of complex combinations of NAND gates. 
every YouTube video or Word document or class assignment or, or meme that you've looked at has been a result of complex interactions of NAND gates inside of your computer, resulting in things that you can see and interact with. So if you look at it from that point of view, it's not terribly surprising that the smell of coffee, the taste of pad thai, you know, learning to sew, these things can result from complex interconnections and firings of neurons. So like I said, we can think of these guys as data processing units, it's sort of like a data processing pipeline even. So data comes in one end, is manipulated in some way, and exits through the other end. With processing happening in between the input and the output. Now, one important thing to, to note here is that neurons can take many, many inputs, but they have one single output. So all these signals go in, they get processed, and then a single effectively on and off signal gets sent out the other end. <clears throat> so this is a Purkinje cell. Uh, matter of fact, this, specifically, this is a, a, a sketch of uh, a stained uh, microscope slide uh, done by a, a fellow named Santiago Ramon y Cajal. Uh, he's a super famous uh, neuroanatomist. Uh, matter of fact, one of the very first, and he, he's well known for his cell staining techniques, which let him see details inside of cells and outside of cells around them that, that no one else could, could see before. And this is one of the most well-connected cells in your entire body. Purkinje cells are neurons that can take hundreds and hundreds of inputs and process them, and then send those signals processed out through a single axon. Now, how can such complicated behaviors arise from something like this? Well, I like to call on a quote by Douglas Adams, the, the guy that wrote the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy series, and also the Dirk Gently uh, Holistic Detective Agency series. They're, they're both hilarious and awesome series. You, you, sh you should really read them if you haven't. I think Hitchhiker's Guide is almost requisite reading for computer scientists. Uh, anyway, so uh, I love this quote. Complex results arise from simple causes iterated many times over. Now he wrote this uh, talking about the power of com computation, the power of computers, but the same can be said for neurons. Uh, even though these little neurons are simplistic and they do very, very rudimentary computations, when you put them in, in intricate combination with each other, end to end to end, you end up getting incredibly complex results. <clears throat> so you can think of it as, as, a, as a kind of uh, biological cooperative processing. One of the examples I like to talk about is actually the ability that we can see faces at all in the world. So when we look out and we, we, we see a scene in front of us, our brains can pick out human faces, and we can do it really, really well. And so here we have a human face, or a human-ish face, and over here we have uh, an eyeball, uh, effectively a sense, a biological uh, photosensor. And so what we do is we take input from our sensor and feed it along these neurons, and these neurons process over and over and over, and eventually some little flag goes up in your head that says, ah, a face was seen inside of my field of view. And that's really, really elegant processing. That, that, that's cool that we can take essentially uh, a huge array of light and process it down and then raise a single flag at the end that says, ah, we saw a face inside this visual world that we're experiencing. Now you can take this to the extreme, and some of you might have heard of, of the grandmother neuron theory that uh, for every single thing that we recognize, there's a single neuron in our head that, that lights up whenever we see it. Now, in that, that's sort of th this, this concept taken to its extreme. Uh, in reality, we probably have, have partial overlap representations, uh, but still, the fact that we can take in some weird array of, of sensory information and process it down and then have a flag that raises at the end saying, ah, we've seen a face, We've seen a taco, we've seen a cat, we've seen, we've seen a computer. It, it is really, really interesting. And also a property that our computers don't necessarily have that might be a good characteristic to have. A system that's able to take in structured information and then extract complicated and sometimes very nuanced information from it. So, <clears throat> 
yeah, our neuron acts as a, uh, yeah, yeah, our, our neurons act as these, these simple pipeline processing systems. And it would be really cool if, if we could get this kind of behavior and this kind of ability to, to learn things uh, to, to manifest itself in our software and in our hardware. So let's take a look at this here. This is another microscopic uh, view of, of a real actual neuron. Now, the thing that's interesting about this one is that I've cropped off most of the picture. So if we look at the rest of the picture, we see more details. My goodness, what does this look like? Well, those appear to be little lines on perhaps a printed circuit board. And you are correct. So there's actually research looking at integrating neurons, biological, natural neurons, with computational circuitry. Uh, so that we can take advantage of a neuron's ability uh, to adapt and learn in order to perform complex tasks that we might not necessarily have an alg algorithm defined for already. Now, I believe this is from uh, a group at uh, University of, of Reading in, in the UK. And what they did, and there's actually some really interesting videos out there on YouTube, uh, they, they, they took neurons from a rat brain, not actual rat brains, keep that in mind and uh, integrated those with an electric circuit. And they had them controlling the movement of a robot. So a robot was being driven by a series of neurons, biological neurons, that learned how to navigate a room and, uh, and fire independently. Now keep in mind, uh, this is not a real actual brain. This is literally a smattering of cells uh, that uh, eventually learned how to fire and sequence in such a way to make a robot move around a room without bumping into stuff. Uh, but still, even, even so, it was a, essentially a cybernetic circuit that learned how to perform an action. Now, this is, this is very primitive, and uh, the, the, these things don't live very long, so to speak. And we're, we're very far away from, you know, the, 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 the biological and... Um, technological integrations we see in like movies like you know these guys we're far far away from that uh, the, the, the kind of the closest we've got is is having uh th these these very basic circuits uh interacting with each other but but nonetheless the biological neural networks have these properties that we actually would really like to see in a computer uh, they can have high levels of complexity they can learn independently you don't necessarily have to define an algorithm for a neuron to figure something out. As long as it has feedback, it can usually figure out patterns on its own. But the problem is, natural neural networks are biological and difficult to interface with technology. But, let's take a step back. Let's think about those neurons in terms of uh, logic gates again. They're, they're, they're not totally dissimilar. The, the way they, they behave is different. But their, their actual like sort of pipeline behavior isn't too different from each other. So can we emulate the functions of a natural biological neuron in software or hardware? So can we, uh, can we take this paradigm and essentially turn it into, instead of a squishy thing in the middle, electrical signals coming in, some sort of computational processing unit, and electrical signal going out? So this is one of the things that we'd really like to do. So, so, so essentially make a processing unit like this. And, and we can, and we can do this in software. In software, uh, this is often called a, a perceptron, which frankly, as a perceptual scientist, I take offense at. These guys aren't perceiving anything. Uh, they're, I actually strongly prefer artificial neuron uh, as opposed to perceptron, but, but who am I to argue with uh, the well-established dogma of a research community. Anyway, but essentially the processing that happens is you take input signals coming into this guy, and each of those inputs has a weight associated with it. And then the whole neuron has a bias factor. So the output that, that this guy usually gives is uh, the dot product of uh, the signals and their weights plus this bias factor. And then that's the output that gets sent out to other neurons. Now, again, you know, this guy is somewhat simplistic. It's not a terribly complicated uh, processing mechanism. So neural networks operate 
a lot like really good cakes do. They're best when served in layers. And there are certain layers you're always going to see in neural networks. First, you know, looking back at this example here, when we looked out in the world, we got an array of light essentially as input. And that array of light was fed into a series of neurons. This layer of neurons right here is referred to, not surprisingly, as our input layer. And then at the end, you know, we were, we were looking for faces in our visual field. We had a neuron that raised a flag and said, hey, I saw a face, or I didn't see a face, or something like that. And not terribly surprisingly, this is our output layer. So we have input layers in our neural network, and we have output layers in our neural network. And then everything in between are what are referred to as processing layers. Depending on what uh, textbook you're reading, uh, they're either referred to as processing layers or hidden layers. So if you, if you see those two terms, understand that they're, they're effectively interchangeable. Now, there's a good reason to call the processing layers hidden layers, because they're, they're, they're invisible to you, the user. They're, uh, they're sort of black boxes. That's actually one of the disadvantages of neural networks, is you know the input you're getting, you see the output you're getting, but you might not necessarily understand the mechanism in the middle, this black box, that's processing that input to provide you with that output. And of course, you know, from the computational sense, you know, we replace all these squishy neurons with little bits of software, those perceptrons, uh, essentially little functions that take inputs and provide an output to another function. And then uh, complex results arise. Okay, so this is where we're going to wrap this up for today. Uh, this is just part one of our discussion of neural networks. Uh, we're going to move on to uh, so, so, some, some more nuanced uh, discussion of it uh, beyond the introduction in our next lecture. So uh, I hope you guys, again, are all staying happy, healthy, and safe, and, of course, washing your hands. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, comments, need anything, uh, please let me know.